My name is Bunk Rowe, and we are My name is Saul Yeager. Here he is, Saul Yeager. <laughs> He's killing me already. We are, I like We are at guys. one of Sal's favorite hotels, the Mayflower in Manhattan. And uh, I know this hotel Sal. very well. I spent a week here one night. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> How, Don't uh, use that, uh, Tim. <laughs> if, I'm wondering if, if you uh, could have had a dual career as a comedian. Or do well, you work it in, in what you do? I played <laughs> in shows with people like Jackie Mason, Henny Youngman, Buddy Hackett, Don Rickles. I played many, many years ago up in the Catskills with George Burns, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis. I did shows with them. So all these things rub off. Well, listen, yes, I've sir. been reading something about you, a number of things. Whatever you in want. In 1977, I don't know if, where this came from, but y you were named the city's busiest musician. I still am. And I know, I'm like, I'm looking at the stuff you sent me. Thank you. Well, how do you do it? Six, well, ni six nights a week? I do a double header, Tim, every Sunday. I play Sunday brunch at a place called Tony McGregor's mm -hmm. from 12 to 5, and then I go to a place called Danny C. Palace from 7 to 11. Oof. I enjoy it. It doesn't bother me. No. That's great. Did you, when you were 13 years old, I don't know why I picked 13. That's okay. You well, did the right did, thing. Did you uh, have aspirations to be a full-time musician at that age? Well, when I heard Benny Goodman on the radio, I was about 13 years old then. You're right. What made you pick that year out? No. I have that my age. sources. Okay. I was born whiskey. in 1922. Mm -hmm. If I was born in 1922, Monk, and I heard Benny Goodman on the radio in 1934, how old was I? 14. Okay, then I was 14. Okay. I heard him doing a radio broadcast with his band. And it was an unbelievable band. They were so hot, I still get goose pimples talking about this band. 60 years ago, 65 years ago. Mm. I says, I gotta play the clarinet. I don't know if I was gonna be a professional or what. Uh -huh. Thank God, that's all I've been doing all my life. I've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. I uh, wish my wife was here. I just lost my wife a few years ago. Mm -hmm. We were married for 51 glorious wow. years. I'll show you pictures of her later. All right. She was my wife, my manager, my agent, mm -hmm. and not for her, I wouldn't be here talking to you today, my dear friend. She helped me every way and any way. Mm -hmm. She used to say to me, Tim, my wife, look, you, you play the clan and I'll take care of the business. And she did. Wow. That's why I'm living where I'm living now on 56th Street, Lexington Avenue, mm. for the past 25, 27 years. I'll show you pictures of my wife later, if you don't mind, when she was 15 years old when I met her. 15. Wow. We got married, my dear friend, when she was 16. And we had our first child. My wife was 17 years old. Had I listened to her 30 years ago, I would have been better off. But, you know, mm. I thought I knew all the answers. I thought I was going to, going to be a... A star, you know, stardom. A woman told me last night, she said to me last night, Tim, are you listening to me? You're sleeping. She says, Saw, you're the world's greatest clarinet player. I says, how come? She came up to me, she was crying. She says, Mr. Yeager, you're the world's greatest clarinet player. I said, how come? She says, everybody else is dead. <laughs> and then she says to me, yeah, I belong in Hollywood. She says, the walk will do you good. <laughs> and you know what else she said to me, Monk? <laughs> She says, I belong on a stage. She said, leaves in five minutes. <laughs> yes, indeed. I see Good song. you worked with... Yes, Good song. Yes, yes indeed. indeed it was. Cy Oliver wrote Look, that. don't be that way, okay? <laughs>
Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And that's a different mouthpiece that, <laughs> that I've been using for 30 years. You're right. I don't know how the hell it's working, but right. it's working. Well, if you can play soft on it like that, that's a good, that's a good sign. Thank you, sir. Yeah. By the way, that was Benny Goodman's opening was. song, <laughs> right? Yeah. Carnegie Hall. Yeah. He always played that wherever he played. Mm -hmm. It never failed. He had to play that. People asked for it, and he always had to close the show with sing, sing, sing. Mm -hmm. Imagine playing that five, six, seven, eight times a day and night. Right. He played that at the Paramount Theater. At one time, I'll never forget. Monk, he was playing at the Paramount Theater, Pennsylvania Hotel. He was doing a radio broadcast called The Camel Caravan. He was recording. I don't know where he had time. Gene Cooper told me he had six sets of drums in the city. Oh. And Lionel Hampton told me he had six sets of vibraphones. One at the Pennsylvania... Uh, one at the recording studio, one at the radio station. Uh, let me see where else he had one. One at the Paramount Hotel. He had his drums there, a set of drums there. So it was the Pennsylvania Hotel, the Paramount Hotel, at Paramount Theater. CBS right here on 53rd Street. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. Mark? That's where I saw Benny Goodman the first time coming out of the stage door. Yeah. In, uh, I think it was 1937. I couldn't believe how tall he was. You couldn't believe how tall he was? Yeah. Yeah, oh, he didn't seem like big. a tall person. He was. Six foot two. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, I still love to play. I never get bored playing. If I have to play a song, four or five times a night, it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. I'll play at different tempos, or I'll play in a different key. Right. I know how to get around little things like that. Yeah, yeah. If I have to play a song like As Time Goes By, I, I know how to play it. I can play it like... Um, or if I have to play it again, I can play it... Just give it a little twist. Mm -hmm. Like at Tony Bennett, San Francisco, he has to sing that every show for the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. So I uh, imagine Betty Goodman playing Don't Be That Way and sing, sing, sing. It was unbelievable. Right. The clarinet seems to be one of the harder instruments to play. Very difficult. Did Were you put off by that at first when you were mm. a kid? Mm. It made me... It made me persevere more, Monk, mm -hmm. because uh, I, 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 you know, I enjoy a little bit of a, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? A, a uh, challenge. That's a good word. Thank you for that word. Yeah. A bit of a challenge. I didn't want to use the word battle. Yeah, it was a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and when I couldn't get a piece of music uh, together, I worked on it note by note, my dear friend. Mm -hmm. Not piece by piece or bar by bar, but note by note. I worked on it, you know? Wow. Like, um... Mozart. <clears throat> now, that was in E flat. Now I'm going to play it in the key originally written in five sharps.
What's the name nice. of this, Monk? Too. I've been playing that for 60 yeah. years till I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, your, did, your, to you, sir. did your clarinet teacher, teachers, um, when you were growing up, appreciate swing music? I mean, because you obviously had a good the teacher I went to. I don't know if you saw in the article I gave you, Monk. His name was Simeon Bellison. Mm -hmm. He played solo clarinet with the New York Philharmonic for 40 years. Number one, if you knew you played saxophone, which I did not play saxophone, mm -hmm. he wouldn't teach you. Ah. If you knew you played jazz, he wouldn't teach you. The only one he accepted, because he was a big, big name, was Benny Goodman. And I was studying with Simeon Bellison at the same time Benny Goodman was going to him in 1946. He lived on Walton Avenue in the Bronx on 161st Street. I used to travel from Brooklyn to the Bronx on a train, a two-hour ride, to take a lesson for one hour and a two-hour ride to go home. And I used to practice my clarinet on a train. I would practice my lesson, Monk, yeah. that, uh, you know, that I won't uh, make any mistakes on the train going up there. And then I would practice my lesson going home so I won't forget what my teacher taught me, Simeon Bellison. Mm -hmm. He was one of the greatest authorities on the clarinet. The greatest. He was a professor. He came from Russia, Moscow. And to show you how great he was, he was nine years old when he played with the Moscow Symphony Orchestra. Is that unbelievable? It's in his life story. Nine years old. Mm. He was just phenomenal. He made his own reads. And uh, as I said, if he knew you played jazz, he said, I can't teach. He wanted everyone to be a symphony clarinetist. I see. Well, you had an opportunity to work with the Buffalo Philharmonic no, I never Just played, that. but I was offered the yeah. position with them. Right. I, I never played, but I, I took an audition. Uh-huh. You know, that sounds very familiar. That rhymes, position mm -hmm. and audition. Anyhow, I took an audition with a man called, uh, let me see if I remember his name, Steinberg. He was a conductor of the Buffalo Symphony Orchestra. I'm pretty sure that was his name, Steinberg. And they offered me the job of like $75, but we had to move to Buffalo. And my wife, who was my manager and agent, she said, let's stay in New York. Mm -hmm. And right after that, I got myself a steady job at Jimmy Ryan's on 52nd Street. Did you, uh, you worked in the, you, I'm sorry, you were in the service, right? You had a stint yes, in the I was in the service for two years. Did you get to play while you were there? Well, luckily, again, for my wife, uh, Monk, originally I was in an outfit called the 297th Combat, 297th Engineer Combat Battalion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what that is. They are the infantry, but they build bridges. Before the regular infantry came along, mm. we used to build a bridge called the Bailey Bridge. So here's Saul Yeager marching with the 297th Engineer Combat Battalion with a gun in one hand, a shovel in the other hand, and I had my clarinet case with me under my arm. Wherever I went, I took it with me because when we took a break for 15, 20 minutes, 
I take out my clarinet and practice a little bit. After being with the outfit for about four or five months, we were going to be shipped out. My wife got me a transfer to the Air Force Band here in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Yes. And uh, I was very fortunate to be with the 395th Army Air Force Band. And there were 30 musicians in that band. And believe it or not, ironically, 28 were from Providence, Rhode Island. They all signed up together. Uh -huh. and they all formed this band, the Army Air Force Band in uh, Fort, Fort Dix, New Jersey. A lot of great musicians were with them. So you were able to do that instead of get shipped overseas? That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> we were all sent overseas. <clears throat> we were sent overseas just the day before I was transferred. Mm. In other words, after I was transferred to the Army Air Force Band at Fort Dix, they went right overseas. Mm. We were at the port of, of uh, port of embarkation, Monk, yeah. at Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. I'll never forget that. And we knew we were going to go overseas in a matter of a day or two. And my wife went to the lieutenant to speak to him on my behalf. His name was Lieutenant Danzinger. Look how I remember that name, 50 mm. years ago. D-A-N-Z-I-N-G-R, Lieutenant Danzinger. But before he was able to give me the transfer, Monk, my wife had to go to see the major of that battalion, and his name was Major Fox. She spoke to him. My wife was pregnant at that time, and mm -hmm. she went to speak to him. But she wanted me to near home, and I was a musician and clarinetist, and I would do more for the yeah in the morale of playing uh, with us with the band. And she got me with the band. Exactly one day before they were shipped out. It was unbelievable. Wow. Well, the music that, that you were attracted to when you began to play, did, did you and the rest of the players think of it as, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this, was it the popular music of the day or did you think of it as, as you were playing something from the past? You talking about when I started to play? It, like a Jimmy Ryan's and right and uh, you know that was the, the popular music yeah. of the day. Sure, right. I didn't know anything about the, the original Dixieland jazz band at that time. Man, I mm -hmm. just thought that this is the music, yeah. Dixieland music and swing music. That was the music of the day. Did people, uh, you played mostly for dancing? No, it was jazz. Yeah. Jazz. Okay. If anybody wanted to get up to dance, they wouldn't prevent them, uh, uh, Monk, but yeah. it was mostly listening. Mostly listening. Listening at Jimmy Ryan's. Yeah. I went in there for two weeks. They stayed there for one year. Uh-huh. And I had a great drummer with me, if you don't mind me mentioning his name. I don't think he's around today. He was from Chicago. His name was Danny Alvin. Great drummer, sensational. And I had Hank Duncan on piano. And we had a trio. Mm -hmm. and we went in there for two weeks. We stayed for one year with this trio. And you know whose place I took? No. He became, he, he, he wasn't my friend anymore. <laughs> I took uh, Mesro. Oh, Mes Mes Mesro's Mesro. place. Yeah. He was playing there, and, I, and they engaged me. Uh -huh. in place of him, right. Milton Mes Mesro, and he never spoke to me. No kidding. After that, right. What were the hours like on a job like that? <clears throat> I think there were about five hours at that time. Yeah. Something like nine to two, can about you five hours. Can you recall what you, what you made for each person in the band back then? I do. What made you ask me that question? 
I think it's interesting to, okay. to see what... I made $50 a week. Mm -hmm. And I was working, I think it was six nights a week. And I'm talking about the 40s. Uh, yeah. Monk, 1946, 47. Was that decent money? 50 I bucks a week. I was able to uh, exist with it. Yeah. Did you ever have to do uh, non-musical jobs to augment your income? No, I've been very fortunate. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. I've been very fortunate just to play the clarinet. And I'm one of the few guys that I can think of that didn't have to make a living by playing saxophone, mm -hmm. clarinet, and flute. I just want to be a specialist on the clarinet. Yeah. I want to play jazz, I want to play classical. I'm able to play klezmer music. I, I just specialize mm -hmm. in the clarinet. I brought you some pictures I'll show you later. All right. Taken of me at Jimmy Ryan's that someone took them off the internet. Oh, really? Wait till you see these pictures. Wow. I'm playing with Rex Stewart yeah. and a lot of other jazz musicians. Well, the list of people <clears throat> you've been with is just unbelievable. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Fletcher Henderson. What, what can you tell me about working well, with Fletcher? A very fine gentleman. Yeah. A wonderful man, a wonderful pianist. And uh, one of the highlights of my career, because I knew about his music with Benny Goodman, and he actually took me under his wing. He was very nice to me, mm -hmm. very warm and gracious to me. And... Uh, Every time I played with Fletcher Henderson, I was thinking about the days that Benny Goodman was playing his music. King Porter Stomp, yeah. wrapping it up, stealing apples. Dear old Southland. And I played with him, uh, I felt like I was in my glory. Mm -hmm. He's a wonderful musician, wonderful. What about working with, uh, you know, I hear an awful lot of <clears throat> stories about Eddie Condon. I play with him character. occasionally, you know. Yeah. I wasn't the number one clarinet player with mm -hmm. him, I'll be very honest with you. The number one clarinetist was Pee Wee Russell. And then when Pee Wee Russell wasn't able to make it, they used uh, Tony Parenti a wonderful Dixieland clarinetist from New Orleans. And then they used the uh, other musicians, <clears throat> clarinet players, worked with him for a while, was uh, Peanuts Hucko, a wonderful clarinetist. But when they couldn't get these <clears throat> clarinetists that I mentioned, then they came to me. Mm -hmm. I was like the low man on yeah. the totem pole. But whatever they called me, they called me. Right. I, either I worked at Eddie Condon's or I worked at Nick's in the village. Uh -huh. I worked there with Muggsy Spanier, with Pee Wee Russell. Uh, I'm sorry, not Pee Wee Russell, with uh, Pee Wee Irwin. Uh -huh. I played there with Pee Wee Irwin's band, and the trombone player at that time was Miff Mole. So you get a gig, uh, when you went to a club to get a gig, did you have an actual band in mind, or did you get the gig and then find the musicians to do it? I usually did what you just said, Monk. I got the gig and then I was able to pick up the musicians to right. do it. Like I was a side man for a while at Nick's playing, as I said, with Muggsy Spaniard, Pee Wee Irwin, Jimmy McPartland, Miff Mole, and then they asked me to bring a band in, a mm -hmm. Dixieland band, which I did. And I was the last band to play Nick's. I was proud to say I had the opportunity to go in there with my own band just before they went out of business. After being in the business like 50 years, then it became a place called Your Father's Mustache oh. with banjos. So they oh. changed the whole policy. But I was the last, <coughs> last band to go in there. Everybody that you would call would be expected to know a certain repertoire of tunes <clears throat> oh, yeah. at the time. Sure, we had to know all the Dixieland uh, songs like the Muskrat Ramble 
and that's a plenty, and Shimmy Shawabble, <laughs> and Panama, and Sister Kate, and Ball in the Jack, and. <laughs> George Very Brown. Sweet, indeed. Great, <laughs> great piece of music. <clears throat> that was written by my friend Maceo Pinkard, one of the great composers. Maceo Pinkard. Gee, I hope he got royalties from the uh, Harlem Globetrotters. You know, <laughs> that became their theme song for all those years. You're right. Yeah. They played a perfect tempo for it, too. Yeah. Tell me about. Um, getting hooked up with with Steve Allen and uh, I was working at a place right before the Metropole uh, Monk at a place called the Somerset Hotel on 47th Street off 7th Avenue <clears throat> the Metropole was on 48th and 7th Avenue I was there with a trio and he used to come in every night to sit in with me Steve Allen this is before he had a show. He yeah. had just just come into New York from Chicago. And we used to let him sit in with us all the time. And we became very good friends. I brought you some pictures of he and I together when we made the Benny Goodman picture. And I'm indebted to him mm -hmm. quite, a, quite a lot because he's done a lot for me. I've been on a show many a time. There's a picture. <clears throat> of us being on a show, the opening night of the Benny Goodman movie in Hollywood. I was on a show with Benny Goodman, Irby Green, there's pictures of uh, Stan Getz in the band, Buck Clayton, and uh, he's been very kind to me, Steve Allen. And whenever he's in New York, he has to do a musical thing, he always calls me. A great guy. Yeah. And we got a lot of the mileage out of Benny Goodman story. Yeah, yeah. And still being shown today, like right. years later. Was he a good student? Excellent. Yeah. The best. It was unbelievable. After a couple of lessons, he was able to pick up the clarinet and play a, play a blues. Uh -huh. He was very astute. That's a good question you ask. What, um, did <clears throat> Benny like the movie? Benny Goodman did not like the movie. Mm -hmm. It was Holly, Hollywoodized quite a bit, I would yeah. imagine. Believe it or not, uh, Monk, the picture did very well in Japan, Tokyo, Japan. I found out sometime later after we made the movie that it stayed at one theater for over a year. That's how popular it was. It was very, very big in Japan, uh -huh. Tokyo. But. Uh, they selected Universal International Pictures, selected Steve Allen, and Benny Goodman gave his okay, but then I don't, I think he regretted it. And then Steve Allen selected me to be his coach, mm -hmm. and Benny Goodman had to give his okay also. I see. What was Benny's personality like for you? What can I say? He was the king. He was the greatest. Mm -hmm. I don't care what he said or didn't say. Right. I was happy to be in the same room with him. Uh -huh. I used to go to all his rehearsals, every one of his recording dates, Monk. Yeah. And one day I came in late. They started at a certain time. I came in about 
15, 20 minutes later, because I was living in Brooklyn at that, he says, Saul, you're late. Like that, he would say that to me. <laughs> I felt, you know, yeah. very elated that he even said that to me. Mm -hmm. He was very nice, very gracious and warm to me. His wife, yeah. Alice, was a very fine woman. Mm -hmm. His brother-in-law, John Hammond, was very nice and warm to me. You and your wife have all, your wife <clears throat> handled all your affairs for everything. all those years. She took care of everything. Yeah. When we had to make, when we had to make the contract deal to go to Hollywood to make the movie, she, she handled the business mm -hmm. for me. We went out there for three months and we had a glorious time, glorious time. We used to go playing at night, Monk. We went to a jam session place every night in Glendale, California. I remember as if it was yesterday. It was called the Melody Club. I used to go over there with Buck Clayton, with Herbie B. Green, Zoot Sims, Teddy Wilson went out there. We all went out there to sit in and play every night. Because, you know, when you were making the movie, they didn't get a chance to play very much because they were just waiting around. Yeah. Remember, the soundtrack was made <clears throat> before the movie was made. We made the soundtrack first. Mm -hmm. Then they put the sound in while they made the movie. Yeah, so it was like everybody was what they call lip syncing, I guess, right? Correct. Yeah. Sure. Harry James, Ziggy Elman, everybody. You were in a movie yourself, weren't you? Carnegie Hall? Yeah, I was just another yeah. musician in the right. band, but yeah. it was a picture I made many years ago called Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. You're right. How'd you know that? Uh, it's in one of the books. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about working uh, mm. in this <clears throat> weird metropole stage. It must have been kind of different to be all at the Stand right. in a row. Wall to wall jazz, they called it. All in single file. We had one drummer at this end of the uh, stage, Monk. We had another drummer at that end of the stage. <laughs> we had two little upright pianos. I think they were like spinets. That's what they call them. We had two sets of drums. So it was a very strange thing, but we all got, we all became uh, acclimated to it. Mm -hmm. I know I did after being there for 10 years. And I had a chance to play with the greatest of the greats. Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, Cozy Cole, George Wetling. Everyone was there. Lionel Hampton was there with his band. It was unbelievable. Tell me about uh, working with your own group. As How did the musical seen change for you over the years? I mean, you've always managed to find work, but has there been a number of years or a decade where things have been tougher? Oh, yeah, sure. Musical? Places I worked for years no longer existed. Uh -huh. Restaurants out of business, nightclubs out of business. I mean, like we're talking about Eddie Condens. They folded up when they moved from the village. They were in the village. They moved uptown to Sutton, to the Sutton Hotel, mm -hmm. 56th Street. They were there for a couple of years or so, and then they went out of business. The Knicks went out of business. The Metropole went out of business. <clears throat> I was at the Gaslight Club for 10 years with my quartet. Eventually, they, they went out of business. I had a quartet, in, which included Ray Nance. And, mm on cornet with me. When did it become, let's say, acceptable to mix racially in the groups in New York City? Or was there ever a problem for you? Not that I know of. I've, no? I've been playing with black and white musicians all my life. I started, and I have pictures to prove it. I'll show <laughs> them to you. At one time, I was on a stage with Jimmy Jones on piano and John Levy on bass. I'll show you the pictures. See, when Benny Goodman first started out with his band, 
1935, he had Teddy Wilson with him, and 1936, Lionel Hampton. When he played certain places, they didn't want. Mm -hmm. He says, he said, this is my band. You take me as it is. He didn't. He may have said this. I don't know, but it's like saying, what you see is what you get. I mean, he didn't delete. Lionel Hampton because he played, uh, because he was black, and he didn't let the Cootie Williams out because he was black, and he didn't leave uh, Teddy Wilson off, uh, out of the band because he was black. You know, Benny Goodman one time had an all-black rhythm section, and I was there. Hmm. He had Big Sid Catlett on drums. He had John Simmons on bass. He had Charlie Christian on guitar. Yeah. And he had Fletcher Henderson on piano, and I was there wow. when they were playing at Frank Daly's Meadowbrook Monk in New Jersey. He had an all-black rhythm section. In fact, I'll even tell you, he had a black saxophone player with him at that time, Bud Johnson. Oh, Bud Johnson. So he had uh, he had his uh, a share of black yes. musicians at one time, a full array. It's a real shame Charlie Christian didn't last no. longer. Did he cause quite a sensation oh, yeah. with what he did? Oh, yeah. He was a very young man when he passed away. Very, very young. I think he was like 23, 24 yeah. years old. What do you feel about the this, this state of jazz music today when you do you listen to any of the local radio stations, and do you like what you hear? I particularly don't like what I hear anymore, uh, Monk. I lived, I listened to a radio station all my life for 50 years, and W N E W, with a man called Martin Block, and he played the greatest of them all. He played Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey, Jan Savitt. He played the greatest bands of all, Glenn Gray and the Casaloma Band. You don't hear those records anymore. Mm -hmm. You don't hear that kind of music anymore. Yeah. Well, jazz, in some sense, became, in the 60s, it became kind of political. It became sometimes angry. Do you? Do you think it angry? Uh, well, when I think of fellows like Coltrane and oh. in that, it's like they were. It was very, very emotional. On a style like Miles Davis, you're right. Yeah. Very emotional. I didn't know John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. I uh, I knew Miles Davis when I was playing. When I was playing at Jimmy Ryan's, he was across the street at a place called the Three Deuces. Mm -hmm. Miles Davis. But uh, believe me, in those days, it was only the late 40s, they were angry and hostile, too. Mm -hmm. I think it was 1946, uh, quite a significant number of the big bands bit the dust. In the late 40s. Yeah. In your eyes, what was the reason for that? Probably because the... Uh, Maybe because of rock and roll coming in. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I remember a lot of places that the bands used to play in Monk were not around anymore. Mm -hmm. There was no music at the Wall of a Story anymore where Benny Goodman played and Xavier Cougat played. And there was no Roosevelt Hotel anymore where they had music with Guy Lombardo. And there was no uh, Paramount Theater anymore where they had all the big bands. And there was no Strand Theater anymore where they had the big bands. And there was no Capitol Theater anymore where they had the bands. It was just unbelievable. Slowly and slowly by slowly, all these places disappeared, Monk, mm -hmm. where they had bands working yeah. seven days a week, seven nights a week. The Roseland Ballroom, I remember seeing Fletcher Henderson there with his band. I saw Harry James there. I saw Tommy Dorsey at the Roseland. I saw my friend Jimmy Dorsey playing there. I just disappeared. Yeah. But there was a lot of great music at one time. Uh, 
I'll never forget the Lincoln Hotel on 46, 47th Street and 8th Avenue. I used to hear Artie Shaw's band, or some band, some great band. Charlie Barnett played that room. Jan Sabbath played that room. It was owned by a woman called Marie, Marie Kramer, her mm -hmm. name was. She owned these two hotels, the Lincoln Hotel on 8th Avenue and 47th Street, and then she owned the Edison Hotel on 46th Street off Broadway. But she used the sweet bands at that hotel. She used bands there like Blue Baron, and Sammy Kay, and another band that became a hotel band later on, Henry Jerome and his orchestra. She used all the sweet bands at that hotel, mm -hmm. the Edison Hotel, and the Lincoln Hotel, she used all the hot bands like Artie Shore and, and Charlie Barnett and Jan Sabin. I'll never forget the first time, even though, you know, I, I adore Benny Goodman, when I first heard Artie Shaw play in person at the Lincoln Hotel, begin to begin, it was unbelievable. That sound was just unbelievable, uh, the way the band came in. Had Buddy Rich on drums, Tony Pastor on saxophone. Very exciting sound, mm -hmm. very exciting. And the band was right on. Mm -hmm. He had a very tight band. I'll never forget when he was at the Strand Theater at the same time Benny Goodman was at the Paramount Theater. Uh -huh. I was there. I see. In fact, it says that in the article I gave you, Monk. Uh -huh. There was a big sign at the Paramount Theater with a picture of Benny Goodman with his clarinet, King of Swing. Then you walk up four, five, six blocks at the Strand Theater, a big sign, Artie Shaw, King of the Clarinet. Ooh with his picture. Uh -huh. At the same time, they both appeared. It was unbelievable, exciting. Everybody was running back and forth. Uh -huh. It was a very, very exciting two weeks. They were like rock <clears throat> stars of the day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Did they get along at all? Or did yeah, they, they were sort of friends. I have a picture of, uh, somewhere at home, I have a picture of uh, Artie Shore and Benny Goodman together. I think it was, I think it was uh, Benny Goodman going to see and hear Artie Shaw's band. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it was that way. I wonder if anybody ever thought of trying to get them to record together, or maybe that's that possible. Yeah, they worked in the same band together on radio. I don't know if you no. know this, Monk. I have a picture also of a band called Al Goodman and his orchestra, not related to Benny Goodman. Uh -huh. Al Goodman and his radio orchestra. And he had that band playing saxophone and clarinet, Benny Goodman and Artie Shaw uh, together. Wow. This was like a 25, 30 piece orchestra with strings and all, they played radio shows. Nice. Al Goodman and his orchestra. Then I have a picture of Benny Goodman just playing clarinet with Lenny Hayton's orchestra. It was a band called the Ipana Troubadours. I don't know if you ever heard that. That was a radio show. Uh -huh. And that was a great band. It was, it was a radio uh, a broadcast for Ipana Toothpaste. And Benny Goodman was a clarinetist in that band and a wonderful trombone player who became a comedian like me. <laughs> Jerry Colonna was oh, a trombone yeah, player sure. with that band. That was a wonderful band. You made a record with Chubby Jackson years ago? Oh boy, you have a good memory, yeah. He's a he's a real pistol himself. Oh yeah. You two must have been something together. A very funny guy. <laughs> he, very, very humorous. He has a good attitude. He loves to play. And uh great player. I don't use that word loosely. Mm -hmm. To me, that word great, uh, Monk, is a superlative. Benny Goodman, great. Louis Armstrong, great. Teddy Wilson, great. Art Tatum, great. 
Chess Stacy piano, great. Mel Powell, great. And there were some good players. Yeah. But uh, the ones I just mentioned, great. Lionel Hampton, great. Harry James, great. <laughs> Ziggy Elman, great. Toots Mandelo, great. Jaime Schreitzer, great. Johnny Hodges, great. Coleman Hawkins, the greatest. He recorded with me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that. I made an album when I was at the Metropole. Yeah. And Coleman Hawkins was an extra added attraction on my album. Wow. He helped sell my album, Monk. Uh -huh. His name, believe me. I was very, very indebted to him, willing to record with me. Was it a, a 10 inch record at that time? No, I think it was a 12 inch yeah. record. Yeah. Boy, I'd like to see something like that. Yeah, it was made on, I think it was originally made on London Records, and then it was sold to Phillips yeah. Records. I don't even think I have a copy of it, yeah. I'll be honest with you. Coleman Hawkins, he was unbelievable. One of a kind, mm. one of a kind. When he played with Fletcher Henderson's band that in the late 20s and 30s, he stood out, as they say, as like a sore thumb. That's how powerful he was. Uh -huh. He was just, you can't even describe him, oh. how he overshadowed all the other musicians mm -hmm. in that band. And he had some great players. Yeah. Uh, Fletcher Henderson had the people like uh, uh, Buster Bailey, and Clarinet, and J.C. Higginbotham, and Hilton Jefferson. Coleman Hawkins was something else. Have you seen any change in your business or your audience in the last few years because of this uh, swing revival? Yeah, they, sure, they're bringing back a lot of the big bands. Mm -hmm. I have been playing Monk for the last five or six years. I gave you an articles with a band called Felix and All the Cats. And he has a swing band, a 15-piece swing band, very similar to the Benny Goodman band. Mm -hmm. We do Stealing Apples, Wrapping It Up, King Porter Stomp, Bugle Call Rag, One O'Clock Jump. We play a song with the band. <laughs> Tell you the tables on me, yeah. and then we, we we have an arrangement of a song called "It's Been So Long." Was lovely. That's a song called It's Been So Long. Yeah. One of the great ballads that he gave him plays. He went, he did this, Monk. He once did that. It, it broke me up. How he went from the high register to the low register. His, uh, 
his command of the clan that was unbelievable. Mm. Believe me, I mean, I heard every clarinet as he could mention in prison, uh, Monk, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, Jerry Wall, Tommy Reynolds, Woody Herman, Johnny Mintz, Buster Bailey, Peanuts Hucko, Pee Wee Russell. I heard them all. But Benny Goodman was untouchable. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget when Artie Shaw was interviewed on the Johnny Carson show one day. And I, uh, I could imagine he must have had a lot of, you know, he gave up the clarinet, yeah. and I found out why, because he didn't want to be number two. Oh. That was his reason. He knew Benny was number one all the way. And he once, uh, he was on the Johnny Carson show, I remember what he said. He says, Benny Goodman played the clarinet, but I played the music. Just like that, he said, mm -hmm. very adamantly, very arrogantly. He says, oh, yeah, Benny Goodman played the clarinet, but I played the music. That's exactly what he said. Uh -huh. But that was one of the reasons I found out from the members of his band why he actually gave up the clarinet. He didn't want to be number two. Mm -hmm. If he felt he couldn't be number one, he just gave it up. He walked off the stand. He walked off. He left his clarinet like that. <laughs> and he walked right off the stage. Tony Pastor told me the story. Tony Pastor was the one that put his clarinet in the case, and that was, oh the, that was the end of his career. Benny Goodman actually never said hello to me. He would always say to me in Jewish, monk, you making a living? And he would say to me in Jewish, machaleben, M-A-C-H, machaleben, I don't know, L-E-I-B-E-N, I think. But he would always say that. And his brother would say that to me also. Harry, the bass player, lovely guy, great guy. Just passed away recently. Harry Goodman was like 95 years old. Mm. And he would always say that to me. Makhalevin, Makhalevin, you're making a living? You know, Benny Goodman came from a very, very poor family. Uh -huh. And he came from a family, I think it was like, Ten children, if I'm not mistaken. He was making a living playing his clarinet for his family at the age of maybe 13 years old. He supported his family. His father was a tailor. His father got killed by a truck in Chicago. And Benny Goodman's first job, Tim, was doing an imitation of Ted Lewis. Oh. That was his first job, uh, Monk, the first paying job. But that's a true story. He supported his family at that time, at the age of 13 years old. He had a brother called Irving Goodman who played trumpet. I don't know if you remember him. He had another brother who became his manager later on, Freddie Goodman. He had his brother, Harry Goodman, bass player. He had another brother called Joe. Then he had another brother that got killed in the army. A young boy, he was like 19, 20 years old. Jerome, oh. Jerry, got killed. Then he had two sisters whom I knew very well. Ethel, Ethel Goodman, what a lovely lady. Ethel and Ida. How many children is that all together? I lost track about How many seven. children is that? How many is that? Count with me. Harry, Irving, Freddie, Joe, Jerry, two sisters, Ida, and Ethel. That's seven. I don't think I missed any. <laughs> Irving played trumpet. Freddie played a little trumpet, but not that good. Mm -hmm. He wound up being Benny Goodman's manager. Irving Goodman was with Benny Goodman's band, I'll never forget, at the Hotel New Yorker. Mel Powell was the piano, was the pianist at that time. 
And I was there the night they introduced Peggy Lee to sing a song called Why Don't You Do Right. Oh. And that song took off like gangbusters. Every set after that he went on to play, he had to play that song. Da 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 it was just it was like a magic that song. Yeah. Imagine her singing this song every every night. Right. Every set. Uh-huh. That was some band. Irving Goodman was on trumpet. I'm talking as if it was yesterday, my dear friend. It was the Hotel New York on 34th Street. It's still there. Irving Goodman and Jimmy Maxwell was on trumpet, and a fellow from Philadelphia called Alec Fowler. Do you know that name? No. Trumpet player. Wonderful trumpet player. F-I-L-A. Alec Fowler. And he had in the saxophone section a fellow called Cliff Strickland, who played tennis sax. Wonderful player. Marvelous. Never got any recognition. Mm -hmm. Man, you he must did. have a thousand tunes in your head. How least. many? <laughs> How many did you say? How many? Hundred thousand. More than that. <laughs> now, do you say a thousand? I said a thousand. More than that. More hundreds. Than that. Hundreds of thousands. I once won a bet, Monk, bro, in a car going to Atlantic City maybe 15 years ago that I couldn't play the clarinet from New York to Atlantic <laughs> City nonstop. I won a bet that time. It was a $100 bet. And I played from New York to Atlantic City. I played songs starting off with the letter A, mm -hmm. which was all of me, I remember as if it was yesterday. And the last song was Z, Zing Goes the Strings of My Heart. Oh, I must have played easy 183 songs, maybe more, who the hell knows? Yeah. Just one chorus, I would yeah. play like this. <laughs> Then I would think of another song with A, <laughs> All the Things You Are. <laughs> then I think of another song, A, Alexander's Ragtime Band. Autumn now, in New York. What? Autumn in New York. Right. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Exactly. I'm not through yet. <laughs> He's terrific. When I couldn't think of any more songs with A, then I went to B. Yeah, I see. All right, let me do Autumn oh. in New York. Good song. You know who wrote that, don't you? No, I don't. The same man who wrote I Can't Get Started, Vernon Duke. Vernon Duke. Mm. Do you know his real name? He was a very dear friend of mine. I did a Broadway show with him called Sweet by and by. Put that down in your lighter notes. The show never came to New York. We played New Haven, Connecticut. We played Philadelphia. We played Boston. The show folded up for some reason. Mm -hmm. Never came to New York. He did all the music in that show, Vernon Duke, but his name at that time was v Vladimir Dukelsky. He came from Russia. Wow. And that was the name he used, Tim, on the music, Vladimir Dukelsky. You look him up in the books of songwriters, you'll see Vernon Duke, Vladimir. And he was my very dear friend when I did the show with him. And you know who else was in the show? A girl singer who became a big star later on, Dolores Gray. Do you remember that name? No. She was terrific. I don't know what would have happened to her. She was a beautiful gal. She was stately looking. She came out with a negligee to sing a song. It was unbelievable. Mm. And then uh, we had a fella in the show, Tim. Are you listening or are you sleeping? <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's a show, fella in the show who was a pantomimist. Did I say that name? Yeah, pantomimist, yeah. Gene Sheldon. Do you know that name? Played banjo? No. He was terrific. He was terrific. He did all these little things without talking, then he come out with a banjo. Uh -huh. And then we had a comedian in the show. Does anybody remember from the radio days a fellow called Walter O'Keefe? 
That sounds familiar. Put his name down. He was one of the greats. Walter O'Keefe to me was like a Fred Allen mm -hmm. or, a, or a Jack Benny. We were very funny. In the show, a guy comes up to Walter O'Keefe. He says, I haven't seen you in years. And Walter O'Keefe would say, it's been longer than that. It's been months. <laughs> Now, that sounds funny in this show. And then he says to Walter O'Keefe of the show, he says, you know, if I would have hung out with you, if I would have been with you, we would have made millions. And Walter O'Keefe said, more than that, we would have made thousands. <laughs> but the way this line yeah. went in the show was terrific. Yeah. And I was the only one who kept laughing in the pit band. We had like a 25-piece orchestra. And I laughed every night at the same routine. <laughs> I'm trying. Is, is there a writer show called, uh, uh, what was his name? Allen something. It'll come to me. He wrote the book. Okay, I got it. S.J. Perlman. You ever hear that? He wrote the, uh, he wrote the, the, the show, the script for the show. S.J. Perlman. Mm. Very funny guy, but why the show never came to New York, I'll never know. And Vernon Duke wrote the music. He wrote a song where we use this song. Oh, thank you, sir. You see, I understand the Indian language. <laughs> You're terrific, Tim. I like you. Uh, he wrote a song that you would have loved, Monk, called low and lazy, which she sang with a negligee, Dolores Gray. Mm -hmm. She came out on the corner of the stage with a pin spotlight, is that what you call it? Yeah. It was gorgeous. And she sang this sexy song called Low and Lazy. Then he used the song again at the second part of the show with a beat, and he called it Crisp and Crunchy. <laughs> The same song uh -huh. with a beat it was so intelligent what he did. And I, I don't know, I may still have the music for this show. Mm -hmm. The name of the show was called Sweet By and By. It was written by S.J. Perlman, music by Vernon Duke. I wonder if I still have that music. Crisp and crunchy and low and lazy.
boy, oh boy. Oof. It can't be George Gershwin. Mm -mm -mm. Benny Goodman played with the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra one day a medley of George Gershwin songs, which I try to play for you right now, Monk, where he started off with the Rhapsody in Blue. I'm going back to the early 1950s, 50, 51. In fact, I was working at the Metropole then, come to think of it, and I took off. The owner, Ben Harriman, was very upset with me that I took off. <laughs> I told him, I want to go to see Benny Goodman. He said, where's he playing? He thought he was playing in the city here where I could hear him and then come back to work. I says, no, he's playing at the, uh, at the Academy of Music in Philadelphia. He says, you going all the way out there to see him? I said, yes. Anyhow, he played this Rhapsody in Blue with this Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra. And then he did a medley of George Gershwin songs like Someone to Watch Over Me and embraceable you, and then he ended up with the man I love. It was so beautiful. It actually brought tears to my eyes. He played it like, like a classical, you know, like with, with, with strings, like he would play. And the last piece he did with the orchestra was what he did. Mm. He went down the low register. It was just beautiful. It was like, I'm going back 45 years ago. And I'll never forget that concert, my dear friend. Mm. And he did this with the symphony orchestra, a medley of George Gershwin songs. It was just gorgeous. OK. Could you, uh, could you um, I want to come up there. Hamilton. honor with me with uh, a rendition of Moon Glow? Surely. It'll be my pleasure. Uh, it's always one of my favorites. It'll be my pleasure. That was another song I played going to Atlantic City. <laughs> I'm serious. When you got to the M's. And yeah. the M. I played a song before that. You remember that song? Make Believe? Oh. That was from Roberta. That was a song written by Jerome Kern. Mm -hmm. That was another song I did. Here's Moonglow for you. Thank you.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>